Hello everyone, this is Jane O'Neill from Culturally Curious, and I'm so happy to be bringing you another program. This one's called Creating a Nation, the Founding Fathers in Art. And I had originally conceived that this would be a, a great program for the July 4th holiday season, but it also aligns really well with sort of bigger conversations that are happening in our country today. Conversations about uh, the nature of statuary, the nature of storytelling, and how we even define ourselves as a nation through visual images. So we'll be able to touch a little bit on those ideas, but I hope uh, today's program can maybe inspire some deeper conversations about all of that after you, after you watch. So, uh, as we get before we get started, I just wanted to note the image that I have on the screen here is John Trumbull's depiction of the Declaration of Independence, the signing or the presentation of the, the Declaration of Independence. And we'll be delving into this image a little bit more in depth later on in the program, but I just wanted to acknowledge what we have here. And this is such a great painting that um, prompts a lot of thinking about uh, the documentation of historical events. So, so we'll be touching on that as well. So here's how we'll navigate this topic today. And the program will be about an hour. So sit back, relax, get comfortable. Uh, so here's how, how we're going to move through the, 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 it, the topics. I wanted to start off with this kind of historical overview of the idea of art and nationhood and how art is so integral to the storytelling of who we are as a nation in the United States, but how it has always functioned this way in the, the history of Western art. So we'll look at a few key representations of this. We'll then turn our attention to very early depictions of our founding fathers. So we'll be mostly looking at um, revolutionary heroes and George Washington and work by John Singleton Copley and Charles Wilson Peale. Then we'll turn our attention to the artist who's really considered the best um, portrait painter from early America, and that is Gilbert Stuart. We'll look at his work. And then I love this, this section here about battle scenes and historic events. And that's going to give us that opportunity to really sort of consider what is art and, and what is kind of historic documentation and where do you draw the line there. And then we'll wrap up kind of thinking of uh, how art can, can um, sometimes misrepresent the, the, the facts or the history and, and sort of the danger of looking at uh, art as history, particularly when it was created um, so long after the fact. So he, these are our topics, so let's dive right in. Okay, art and nationhood. This is going to be a really brief kind of historical overview in terms of how art has been how art has been used to um, communicate um, national storytelling. How it's I mean very simply how it's been used as political propaganda, and it's uh, this has been the case for thousands of years. You can say that it's really part of the Western tradition in art. I mean, prior to the camera, this is really the only way a leader would be able to kind of tell the story of who he or she really <laughs> is, um, but also tell the story or help to really define who the country is. So what we're looking at here, we'll be looking at several um, examples from ancient Rome because they did this very well. Um, and our first example from ancient Rome is this one here. This is a sculpture of Augustus Caesar from the first century. And we see him here in this kind of oratorical pose. So we get the sense that he's a speaker, he's a great thinker, he can command an audience, but he can also command troops. He's got his uh, very detailed armor on here. And let's face it, he also looks great. <laughs> He's a very handsome young leader. He sort of looks like a Greek god. And this is all very intentional. This is the way he was depicted 
throughout his life. And these kinds of images were disseminated throughout ancient Rome. Um, even the little detail of the baby, you can see the baby at his feet has little wings. So this is actually Cupid. So Cupid is included here to sort of suggest um, Augustus's own divine limit lineage. He was uh, said to be a descendant of the goddess Venus. So everything here is really intentional and it all has um, deeper meaning in terms of communicating who, who he is and who is leading the country. So, um, so in addition to depictions of leaders, you also have depictions of historic events. And what we're looking at here is it's called the Arch of, or I'm sorry, the Column of Trajan. And this dates to about the first century as well. And this has always been sort of a mysterious monument in ancient in Rome, because you can see it's several stories high, but the detail work that sort of spirals all the way up this column, and you can see that detail over here on the right, is these sort of smaller figures, these tiny minute details that tell the story of military victories. So you can see boats on the water down here, you can see, uh, soldiers lined up over here. You can see these great battles unfolding at the top of the image on the right. So there's a lot of information and you feel like it's been preserved for posterity, but in this case, maybe not necessarily the best um, presentation of this information for public consumption. Stories about leadership um, continue throughout ancient Rome and here what we're looking at is a giant floor mosaic and it was discovered in ancient Pompeii. It's the story of Alexander and Darius III, a great military battle and um, and like I said it, this is a mosaic so this is all tiny pieces of um, stone and glass and here's a little detail of of our hero, in this case, Alexander. And so you can see, that, I mean, the beauty of the mosaic itself, the, the fact that the artist here is able to render sort of, you know, the suggestion of, of light and shadow and highlights on Alexander's face. But we also get the sense of his humanity, his determination, his fierceness as he's staring down his enemy. This is, uh, this says so much about a leader and about a country when, uh, um, when somebody who is at the helm can be depicted in this way. So once you win a battle, then you have something like this to come home to. And this is sort of a familiar sight in cities um, uh, all around the world. Great cities all around the world have something that looks like this, but it comes from a tradition in ancient Rome and it's called a triumphal arch. And, and it has that name because they were literally um, erected so that triumphant armies could come home and parade through the town, through all of these different archways. So it was a great way to sort of say, we won. <laughs> and, um, and so it, it's, it adds sort of interesting meaning when you think about um, how and why they're placed in cities around the world, <laughs> even in modern times. And I want to draw your attention um, and I should mention that this is the Arch of Titus, which also dates to about first century. I want to draw your attention to a sculpted panel just inside this arch that is probably about life size. The figures here are probably about life size. And as we zoom in on that sculpted panel inside the triumphal arch, the triumphal arch, we can see that there are figures here. These are actually soldiers who are coming home with the spoils of war. So what we're looking at here is an artist's depiction of one of these parades that would go through a triumphal arch. And if you have really good eyes over here on the right, you can see that the artist has also included almost at, um, at a diagonal angle here, uh, the suggestion of a triumphal arch. So we know that, that we, well, now we've got a sense of what, what one of those vic victorious armies might look like as they come home. The last, very briefly, um, object from the ancient world I wanted to share is this one. It, this is called the Dying Gaul, and this shows a, a Roman enemy dying with dignity and with honor. And so we've got, you know, this sort of idealized male form here, and we have um, somebody who has been mortally wounded, and he is, um, He's on the ground and he's responding to these wounds with this sense of um, 
with with dignity, as I said, but 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 without fear, without um, without crying. And so, when you have an enemy who can who can die with this much dignity, it sort of suggests that you, as the victor, are even more impressive. That you can take down. Um, such a worthy foe in this case here. So it's an interesting um, sort of twist where, where you are focusing on the humanity of your enemy. It's a beautiful work. So we're going to zoom forward in our history, <laughs> thinking about art as our art and nationhood to, um, to the Renaissance. And what we're looking at here are um, depictions of leaders and, um, and new representations of power. So in this case, the leader here is standing for nationhood. And we're looking at two portraits of Henry III from about, or I'm sorry, Henry VIII from about the 1530s. And in both of these pictures, he's about 50 years old. They're both painted by um, Hans Holbein the Younger. And they show Henry VIII as this massive figure, the broadest shoulders in the world. All of this material wealth, these outfits are really over the top. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, jewelry, what have you. So it tells you a lot about how the leader thinks of himself and what he's trying to say about the country that he is ruling over. Another really iconic depiction of a leader from about... Um, 1700 is this uh, depiction of the 14th from uh, of France by the artist Rigaud, and where um, where we had uh, Henry VIII who wanted to be very broad, <laughs> Louis the 14th wants to be very tall, and you'll even notice the the little high heeled shoes. He was also really interested in ballet, so he's standing in fifth position here, um, and he's really drawing attention to his. Um, beautiful muscular legs. So, um, so there's this sense, again, an, it, uh, of wealth, of opulence, but also of elegance in, in this picture. Military images are prevalent throughout the history of art. This is another um, Renaissance era depiction, actually, of, of that same battle of Alexandria and, and, and Darius III that dates back to the fourth century, but, but this is a, a, a Renaissance depiction of it. And the focus here is the grand scale of this battle. We have an infinite number of soldiers clashing together here. And we just get the, the, the sense that this is such an important epic event that even it's um, being reflected up in the cosmos, up above in the sky. So, so, um, so it's, it's a story really about um, the overwhelming scale, the chaos, what have you. As we move closer to modern times, it's, uh, you're more likely to see images like this. And this was actually painted by John Singleton Copley, but it was after he became um, an expatriate and he was living and working in, in, in England. And he got this commission to tell the story of uh, the invasion of, of the French, this is the Battle of Jersey. So by the time you're in sort of the modern era, and I say modern, this is a 1784 painting, by the time you're here, you have a, a much more sort of focused storytelling in this painting. And you have John Singleton Copley, not, not as much focused on the scale of the battle, but who are the heroes? Who are the villains? This is a story of martyrdom, of course. So we've got this sort of fallen soldier right here at the center. And, um, and you're able to more connect with the humanity of the women on the right and, um, and the valor of the soldiers on the left. Another big theme in the history of art is the idea of depicting um, the end of the end of battles, um, the agreements between armies, the end of a siege, and the image that we have here is from 1635. This is called the surrender, the surrender at Breda from um, Diego Velasquez. And so what we're looking at here is the exchange of the key to the city of Breda from the Dutch's possession on the left to the Spanish. And look at how magnanimous the Spanish are in accepting the key and, um, 
and accepting sort of the humility and the defeat of, of their Dutch rivals here. And so there's a sense of orderliness with the Spanish on the right and sort of the disorder of, of the Dutch on the left. We even see like burning fires behind them. And right at the center, the artist is able to kind of tell us and to convey who who is who has won here and and not only the fact that they've won but they're doing it with um with this sense of honoring a worthy foe so all big ideas that we're going to see sort of playing out in the history of american art so let's switch our our attention back to america all right so we're going to look at early depictions of america's founding fathers so I want to sort of start off with this idea that generally speaking, some of our earliest depictions of our founding fathers uh, tend to be paintings. But, um, but because George Washington factors in so prominently, I do just want to draw your attention to what we're looking at here. And that is on the left, it is a life mask of George Washington from 1785. So we have a sense of really what he looked like. And it was done by a French artist. And, and, he, and on the left is a plaster, a fire plaster, a, a clay fired plaster sculpture bust of, of the president that dates to the same year. And that's at Mount Vernon. And, um, and so these are sort of important touchstones in terms of what George Washington looked like, but generally speaking, there is not a great deal of sculpture in very early American art. Part of that is because um, you didn't have access to the kind of, kinds of artists who were doing this sort of thing. Um, some of the great sculptors were still working in, in um, Europe. The other part of this is that we also didn't really have great places to house these sculptures yet. So we didn't have a capital per se for to display something like this. So this wasn't necessarily the priority yet early on. So I think it's always good to think of uh, what the artistic landscape looked like in America. And this is a painting by Norman Rockwell that dates to the 1930s. But it gives us a sense in terms of the kinds of artists who were living and working in America early on were for the most part self-taught. They might have been working on things like tavern signs or fireplace screens. And, um, and they didn't have the kind of training, the kind of polish and finish that a European artist might have. I love this picture in, in particular because we see what is probably a self-trained artist who's working on a tavern sign, two of them here that have uh, the face of George Washington. And, you know, it's rendered very simply as compared to the rest of the painting. But I also love this because the onlookers here are just sort of mystified and so interested in the process. And I do think that there's something kind of magical about seeing uh, a work of art kind of come alive before your eyes like this. So our first two artists that we're going to be looking at, these early painters of early America, are John Singleton Copley, and we see him here on the left in a self-portrait. Uh, his dates are 1738 to 1815, and this particular portrait dates to um, about 1780. He was, as far as we know, self-taught. He was based out of Boston. He was connected to a lot of the revolutionaries. And, um, and by the middle of the 1760s, he was really able to, uh, he was successful enough that he was painting portraits of the economic and the political elite in the city. He was doing very well for himself. And then on the right, we have a painting by the artist, uh, a self-portrait by the artist Charles Wilson Peel, who uh, was born just a few years after John Singleton Copley in 1741, and he died in 1827. This is, his portrait dates to about the same time too, 1782. And he studied briefly under Copley, but he also traveled to London and he worked with the American expatriate artist, Benjamin West while he was there. Charles Wilson Peel, um, his output of work from around this time is primarily based in, in the Philadelphia kind of Delaware area. 
So, um, so they have these kind of different bases and access to different subjects as well, as we'll see. So um, let's dive in and sort of see how what they were doing was so incredible. I love this comparison here. <laughs> We've got a portrait by an anonymous limner, probably an itinerant painter on the left. And this is considered to be a great work of art. It's in the National Gallery of Art. And then we have an example of an early painting by the artist John Singleton Copley. And I love this comparison because you can see that John Singleton Copley was painting in a way that was, must have been absolutely astounding to people living in America at this time. The image on the left shows obviously a young man with a, with a pet or an animal, but it's, you know, it's relatively flat. There's only sort of the suggestion of perspective with the tiled floor. Seems like the artist is really struggling with anatomy. We've got this very long torso and very short legs. And, um, and we don't really have um, a true kind of representation of naturalism or realism here. And then we turn our attention to what John Singleton Copley is able to accomplish, and it's absolutely stunning. Every part of it, from the shine in the hair to um, the shine of that kind of silky pink collar to the ruffle on the sleeves. This is a depiction of um, the artist's half brother with his pet squirrel. Let's just zoom in here. Look at the skin. The skin just absolutely glows. Um, the eyes, even the, the, the little uh, squirrel here is just kind of delightful. I love the ruffles coming out of the jacket, uh, uh, the ruffles of the shirt sleeve here, this delicate golden chain that he has his pet on. All elements of this really show that John Singleton Copley could really, um, he was just astounding at capturing um, textures in particular. And so even before he was painting, the revolution he was creating images like this uh, he was well known to create these kind of pendant portraits of husband and wife so this is james and mercy otis warren the states to 1763 so he's painting prominent families and he made them look great in particular her dress is just to die for. Who wouldn't want to wear a dress that looks like this and have it be preserved for all time? Um, Copley sort of develops this um, signature style where it almost looks like there are these kind of um, not harsh shadows, but but the faces are kind of marked by a strong, almost cold white light with a shadow um, for uh, for for modeling. But it it becomes kind of his signature, helps to identify his work. But of course, the most important work by Copley during um, this early part of American history is this one here. And this is, of course, Paul Revere. This is our first kind of depiction of a hero of the revolution. What does a hero look like? How do we define it? And so right off the bat, you'll notice that this doesn't really look like these fancy portraits of prominent couples. Uh, Copley's portrait of Paul Revere was actually painted before Paul Revere's famous Midnight Ride. This was painted in 1768. The Midnight Ride was um, a few years later in 1775. And, um, and Paul Revere's real fame probably didn't really come until um, Longfellow's poem from 1861, Listen, My Children, and You Shall Hear, <laughs> The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. So what we have here is, um, is somebody who's prominent in, in, uh, in Boston society for being an artist. So it's, it's really one artist, John Singleton Copley, um, confronting another artist. And so they're kind of sitting across a workbench from each other and, uh, and Paul Revere has the tools of his trade kind of laid out in front of him. Before I delve into that, I just once again kind of want to show how different this is from a formal portrait of, um, of somebody who, who might have been considered um, uh, politically prominent at the time. So this is John Hancock from 1765. I believe he was Copley's neighbor. 
and um, obviously this signer is the Declaration of Independence, but he's wearing a sort of a formal overcoat, right? And he's sitting at a desk. He's not um, directly confronting the viewer here. So we go back to, to Copley's Paul Revere, and we've, uh, we've got a, a much less, um, or a much more informal portrait, no formal jacket. Uh, these beautiful sort of billowy white shirt sleeves are out on display, but such a thoughtful pose, such a thoughtful presentation. And it's as though Copley is connecting kind of the, the work of his hands with the work of his mind here. And we can zoom in on these gorgeous details of the tools in front of him, and then that uh, beautiful silver teapot with the reflections on it. And of course, um, as a silversmith and an engraver, uh, uh, Paul Revere would have been involved in, in making engravings like this one, <laughs> which he is well known for, which was a famous depiction of the Boston Massacre. And so, um, so this took place in 1770, and Paul Revere played a, a major role in, in um, engraving this and, and replicating this image, which of course got um, a, a lot of the colonists kind of agitated against the British because we see this line of British officers who seem to be coldly firing into a crowd of, of colonists here. So if you've been to the Museum of Fine Arts, any time in the past few years, you've no doubt seen that self-portrait by Copley, and he's surrounded by works of silver that, that he himself made. But you can see he's got this really kind of prominent, um, or I'm sorry, it, the, the image of Paul Revere by Copley, <laughs> but he's got this, this incredibly prominent place here in the gallery. And it's almost as though all of the storytelling starts with this image right here. And I love it as a depiction of a hero of the revolution because um, it shows this sense of, you know, it's like scrappy colonists who were the people who were rising up. And I think it's, it's kind of a storyline that, that I think we can still really connect with today. So our next early American, um, portrait painter is Charles Wilson Peale. And he is just really one of my favorite artists. He's such an interesting character. He's, uh, he shows himself here in his self-portrait, actually painting a portrait of his wife. And he is um, attended to by his young daughter here. I believe he had something like 10 children that were able to survive into adulthood. And he named many of them after prominent artists. And so his, he had a, a, another painting, which is called the, scare, the Staircase Group, which is on the right here. It dates to 1795. And it depicts two of his sons, Raphael and Titian, who are also obviously artists. They're carrying a palette and a mall stick here. But he painted this in a style that's called trompe l'oeil, which is French for fool the eye. And, um, and he framed this in such a way that it looked like the, that bottom stair was actually projecting out into our space. And, um, and supposedly when George Washington saw this picture, he recognized the young boys and he bowed to them because it's as though um, this painting itself looked like a, a doorway into a stairwell as opposed to a painting. So, so we already have this sense that Charles Wilson Peale has, has a particular talent with the arts, but he had another great advantage in terms of being an early painter of, of, um, of the American Revolution. And that was, he had served in the Pennsylvania militia in battles against the, Brit the British, and he, um, and he had started painting portraits of fellow officers very early on. So he knew sort of the importance of being able to capture images of military leaders. So on the left is an image of a military leader from, um, from England. This gives you a sense of the style that was uh, prominent in Europe at the time. And then on the right, we have a painting by Charles Wilson Peale of George Washington, a young George Washington in uniform as the colonel of the 1st Virginia Regiment. This dates to about 1772, so it's pre-revolutionary. And George Washington is about 40 years old here. But we can see that um, that Peel is relying on um, on traditions from 
the continent in this case. We see both of these portraits are kind of uh, standing portraits where the figures kind of cut off at the knees. We see their torso. Um, we see them both kind of looking off into the distance. We get all of the, the detail of their costume and, um, and kind of the pageantry of, of military dress. And then uh, the, the landscape is rendered in, in, more, in less precise detail, but, um, but sort of with suggestions to those previous battles here. So uh, this is the first time that George Washington sat for a portrait with Charles Wilson Peale. And he, he'll do so again with six other paintings. And, um, and Charles Wilson Peale used the, all of these paintings that he does of George Washington as the basis for copies. And, he, and I know he does probably more than 60 copies of all of these works because there was this real hunger and a real thirst for images of George Washington. So, um, so here we have a slightly later depiction of George Washington. This is um, from 1779. So this is in the thick of the revolution. This is called Washington at Princeton. And the painting is at the Yale University Art Gallery. George Washington here is, it's about six years later. He's 46 years old. And, um, and I should mention that in 2005, this painting sold for $21 million, which was a record setting price for um, any American portrait. But here, uh, uh, again, we see this kind of uh, casual depiction, full length depiction at this point of General George Washington. And, and instead of sort of staring dreamily off to the side, he's directly confronting us, the viewer. And, and of course, we have Charles Wilson Peale really accentuating his height. All right, so we're going to close out on Charles Wilson Peale with uh, this self-portrait that he renders uh, much later in his life. This is from 1822. And this is at the, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And Charles Wilson Peale, uh, to, towards the end of his life, he created a museum of art and natural history. So you can see there are all these specimens, uh, animal specimens. And in the cases behind him, there's even the uh, skeleton of a mastodon behind him, <laughs> his uh, paint, his palette and paint brushes, uh, a taxidermy kit. <laughs> and up along the top are prominent, uh, on the walls here, are portraits of prominent Americans. And Charles Wilson Peale here is kind of pulling back a curtain and welcoming us uh, into the space. And this particular portrait, that self-portrait, I think is going to be inspired by the next artist that we're going to look at. And we'll, we'll move on to that next artist, um, Gilbert Stewart, in just a moment. Okay, so this is a, a good opportunity for a segue here to our great American portrait painter. And that is Gilbert Stewart. Here we have him. Um, this is a self-portrait that he painted in 1778 when he was about 23 years old. He um, went and studied abroad during the Revolutionary War. He got out of Dodge. <laughs> and so he received um, a great training from, um, from leading artists in England. He was almost two decades younger than John Singleton Copley. And as a young man, he was able to kind of secure the kind of training that Copley didn't. He became very sort of well-established in England and, um, and, and sort of celebrated there. He was the most preeminent portrait painter of his day. And there's about a thousand portraits of leaders that he created during his, his lifetime. So original paintings and copies. And I think, you know, this early self-portrait kind of shows a flair for the dramatic that we don't typically see in, um, in Gilbert Stewart's work. But what we do see is a directness, an honesty. There's always kind of like this soft focus kindness in the way that he paints flesh and skin. And, um, and, and, and I think some of his earliest depictions sort of fall in line with, um, or help us see the differences between monarchy versus, de versus democracy. 
but I wanted to show you uh, very quickly one of the pictures that made him so famous early on in his career when he was still in England. This is a picture called The Skater from 1782. It's a portrait of Sir William Grant. And it was a, a, a widely celebrated picture. It was sort of helped to establish his fame early on. Um, but one of the sort of interesting facets of this was that people really thought sort of from the chest up was the best part of this picture. And there's one art historian who said that it belied the prevailing opinion that Stuart, Stuart made a tolerable likeness of a face, but as to the figure, he could not get below the fifth button. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see that after this, for the most part, Gilbert Stuart is really interested in making sort of portrait busts of, of figures, and he really excelled at faces. So he's in England, but he returns to America, and he becomes singularly focused on creating a painting of George Washington, and then um, sort of earning a keep for his family by making money from reproductions of his work. And within a year of being back, he had secured an introduction to Washington and the opportunity to paint him. So this is one of the most famous paintings that he renders of George Washington. And I think this, this one has great lessons in um, monarchy versus democracy. So, so let's sort of dive into this image and see what Gilbert Stewart is telling us. Um, we have, oh, well, we already looked at Charles Wilson Peale who had painted Washington as a soldier. And now we see him as a statesman. We've seen a hero of the revolution and now we see a real leader of democracy. So Gilbert Stewart, this is his George Washington. It's painted in 1796. This was done in um, uh, its life size. Uh, George Washington was about 64 years old here and in his last year as president. He's wearing a black velvet suit. He's got a dress sword, not a battle sword. And of course, he's got this kind of unusually kind of clenched facial expression, which comes from his famous false teeth. And, and I think um, Gilbert Stewart was a little bit dismayed that his subject looked so um, kind of pinched. He wrote that when I painted Washington, he had just had a set of false teeth inserted, which accounts for the constrained expression so noticeable about the mouth and lower part of the face. And he said that that sculptural bust that we had started with does not suffer from the same defect. So um, there are three copies of this particular painting. One is at the White House and one is at the National Gallery, of Art, the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and what we see here is um, George Washington in this kind of oratorical pose, kind of going back to ancient Rome in many ways, right? And um, and I think, uh, well, we'll get into to the symbolism of what everything here kind of represents, but I also just wanted to compare this to a depiction of a king from around the same time period. This is uh, Alan Ramsey's depiction of King George III in a coronation robe from 1765. So we have these two um, really kind of stunning paintings, of full-length paintings of, of leadership from the 1700s. And, and I think the image on the left, it, it really sort of emphasizes wealth and opulence. And the image on the right, it picks up on tones of that, but it's also emphasizing um, rule of law and, and sort of critical thinking and being able to address the people that, that you're following um, with, a, with a sense of, of responsibility there. So let's zero back in on, um, on Gilbert Stewart's Lansdowne depiction of General George Washington. So there is a lot of gold here. There's that, you know, that same red brocade that we see in a lot of um, sort of high society paintings from this time period. But we also see a desk with um, papers and a quill and all these textbooks, which again, kind of point back to the rule of law. We have um, references to classical architecture here, but in this case, it's really recalling, you know, the Roman Republic, uh, Greek democracy. It's, it's recalling any of the ancient roots for the political systems in place in the 1700s. 
George Washington is short, sort of looks like he's standing in front of a throne, but if you look very carefully, we have kind of this little medallion at the top with the colors of the American flag. And then the detail that I love so much here, which I think is kind of easy to overlook in some ways, is um, the sky. Just outside here, we've got these kind of dark storm clouds, which kind of suggest um, the turmoil of the Revolutionary War. And then the outcome over here on the right is this kind of um, sketchily painted <laughs> rendering of a rainbow, kind of suggesting the turmoil and then the outcome of that war. So this, I, I think this image kind of looms large in our sense of what a presidential portrait should look like, uh, our sense of the way a president might comport himself. And, um, and we're so lucky to still have it because it had been in the White House during the, um, the War of 1812. And um, the uh, First Lady Dolly Madison had the foresight to um, have it removed as the British were coming into Washington, DC. And when they ultimately burned the White House, so we, we can thank the First Lady. I love this kind of illustration of this event from much later uh, for thinking that this painting was important enough to save. All right, so as I mentioned before, one of the copies of the Lansdowne portrait is at the National Portrait Gallery. Here it is um, hung in the galleries. And I should mention that, that this painting was purchased in 2001 for $20 million. So you don't often hear about works of American art, particularly early American art, uh, selling that often or the, the high price tags associated with them, but this is really considered one of the most important works. And you can see that it's flanked by two other very important works by Gilbert Stuart, this portrait of Martha Washington and then a portrait of George Washington over here on the right. We're going to zoom in on that portrait for just a moment. Um, this, this is generally known as the Athenaeum portrait. It was in the Boston Athenaeum for about 150 years. It, it's an unfinished portrait by Gilbert Stewart. It dates to 1796. And this was actually supposed to be what was commissioned by Martha Washington as, as a portrait for her to keep. And clearly Gilbert Stewart didn't finish it. He had other plans for it. He planned to make this painting, keep it, and keep it um, as sort of source material for making copies of George Washington's image. And so this is one that he, he used as inspiration for quite some time. And again, look at the quality of the way the face has been painted here. Um, the hair, everything else is sort of incidental, but, but there's a softness to that face, even though we still have that kind of clenched expression. Um, there's a directness to it. He's looking right out at us. But the skin itself is rendered with, um, with this kind of realism. Um, but also with, with kind of, you know, a glamour shots kind of glow to it that I think makes Gilbert Stewart's paintings really, really accessible and really kind of delightful to look at. And of course, this is the image that um, it is the basis for the image of George Washington on the $1 bill. So we all probably have a Gilbert Stewart painting in our possession in the sense that we have it on the money. And, and supposedly, this image was chosen as that representation of Washington for the $1 bill because it was already so prolific. Um, Copley had made so many, not Copley, sorry. <laughs> um, Gilbert Stewart had made so many copies of this by, by this point that, um, that this was the, this was the, um, the way that the nation already thought of what George Washington looked like. This was their I idea of him. So, um, so this was sort of the natural choice in terms of how he would be conveyed on, on our money. All right, so we have the first president and we also have Gilbert Stewart is painting many other presidents. And I just wanted to kind of quickly show an early and a later portrait that he did of our second president, John Adams. Um, Gilbert Stewart becomes known for these kind of psychologically penetrating portraits that are also in many ways very simple. And he comes up with a formula that really seems to work. For the most part, they're half length or bust length portraits. Um, 
they tend to be in three quarter profile and um, and they tend to have kind of a, a, a dark or monochromatic background. We can see everything beyond the face barely matters, right? Um, we see in this earlier portrait kind of the sketchy quality to um, some of the hair and, and some of the um, some of the details of, of the co of the clothing and the costume here. Even John Adams' fingers in this later portrait are just they. they they're uh, they're sketched in. There, there's not a great amount of, of, of finish here, but but the faces are really wonderful. Now John Adams did not love to sit and have his portrait done. You can imagine that was a lot of time away from working, and he he once wrote, generally speaking, no penance is like having one's picture done. You must sit in a constrained and unnatural position, which is a trial to the temper. But I should like to sit uh, for John, for Stuart um, from the 1st of January to the last of December, for he lets me do just what I please, and he keeps me constantly amused by his conversation. And so you can sort of think of um, Gilbert Stuart as kind of animating the faces of his subjects through um, just great conversation and storytelling. And, and that's really kind of the signature of his work, this ability to kind of animate faces and show humanity too. So he painted portraits of the first six presidents. So these are the five after uh, George Washington. We've got Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and then John Quincy Adams here. And again, it's, that, it's, it's a very formulaic uh, presentation of these figures. Uh, minimal amount of detail beyond, um, beyond the face. And certainly the face is, is the focal point here. It's interesting that for the most part too, he has all of his subjects kind of looking out at us and, and engaging the viewer directly. He also painted first ladies. So this is Abigail Adams from about 1800 and then her daughter-in-law from about a quarter century later. Um, and, and here, I think with this comparison, you can really see that that um, <laughs> we there's uh, again this realism, this naturalism. Poor Abigail Adams, I, I always think, looks so sort of pinched in this portrait. But you can also see that that Gilbert Stuart is able to really render um, their finery, all, all of the lace, so well in both of these images. But for the most part, he's painting um, um, political leaders, um, prominent businessmen. Uh, the American aristocracy. And I just wanted to give you a sense in terms of how they compared to what was being painted in, um, in Europe at the time. So on the, on the left is the um, Gilbert Stuart por portrait of Mrs. Harrison uh, Gray Otis from 1809. And this is at the Rinalda House Museum of American Art down in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. But of course, the Otis House is in Boston. You can visit that from um, uh, historic New England. And here's a very similar portrait by Jacques-Louis David from, um, from Paris or from, from France that was done about 10 years later. So we can see there's a really similar style in terms of dress and hair. And, um, but there's a, a, a real sort of informality in, in the French painting versus um, uh, uh, Gilbert Stuart's ability to, to, to kind of show a formal picture and to not indulge in, in, in the detail. There's, there's this formality to the pose and a directness to the picture that I think is, is really kind of um, consistent throughout his his body of work. And you can see that again in this comparison. Again, we've got Gilbert Stewart on the left and then Jacques-Louis David on the right, the French artist who painted this work um, just a year after the Gilbert Stewart painting on the right. But here we have two images of prominent um, young men. This is Henry Rice, who was a Boston merchant on the left and he went on to serve in, in um, the Massachusetts State Legislature. And again, it's just that, that kind of bustling portrait, three-quarter profile. And, um, and Jacques-Louis David, on the other hand, with the French portrait, I mean, there's a lot of detail of the costume and then kind of this in, um, informal pose, but also directness there that's, that's really appealing. So we can see that 
that um, <clears throat> Gilbert Stewart has, has kind of found his niche here. He boils it down to its basics. He focuses on the face and he's very successful at that. So we've looked at a lot of portraits. Let's take a look at battle scenes and historic events. All right. So the artist that we're going to uh, focus on primarily for this section is John Trumbull, another really important artist from early America. He was born in 1756. This is his self-portrait from about 1802. And John Trumbull is known as a painter of the revolution. Obviously he was a young man in his twenties as um, the war broke out. I love this self-portrait because he's really showing us what he's great at here. He's, um, he's included his palettes and paintbrushes. And I think that's even sort of a small miniature in his hand um, that, that he's kind of covering with his hand. He lost his eyesight in one eye, so painting miniatures became a, a, a great talent for him. So uh, he was a contemporary of Gilbert Stewart's. They were just about the say, same age, but um, unlike Gilbert Stewart, he didn't go and study in Europe during the war. He was on the ground. He was actually a personal aide to George Washington, and he witnessed the Battle of Bunker Hill. So it was only years later that he decided to commit himself to painting and that's when he went and studied abroad which is when he was encouraged to paint scenes from the revolution um, and oftentimes he would paint them in, um, by first in, um, painting a miniature portrait of one of the leaders of the revolution and then kind of transcribing that to a larger painting he did about 250 uh, miniature portraits in his life all right so, like I said, he witnessed the Battle of Bunker Hill, and this is probably one of his most famous paintings. It's called The Death of General Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill. The Battle of Bunker Hill took place in 1775, and John Trumbull painted this um, more than a decade later, 11 years later. So even though he was a witness, it's really interesting to think um, how much of this picture is based on what he saw and how much of it is just him trying to be a good storyteller or how much of it is him thinking about um, traditions in art and trying to tell a story using those traditions. But this is probably the most iconic battle scene from the revolution. There's two versions of this, one's at the MFA in Boston, one's at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And I should mention that General Warren became, um, uh, sort of already was, and then um, with his death became this really celebrated figure of the revolution. Next time you're in Boston, you'll start noticing that there's all these things named after Warren. Um, so what we see here is a picture that's really about his martyrdom. And, and, um, and Trumbull's trying to tell us this in, in as, clear, as ter clear of terms as possible. So very quickly, I wanted to show you a, a few earlier depictions of the Battle of Bunker Hill, just to show you how what Trumbull does is so different. This is Winthrop Chandler's Battle of Bunker Hill, painted just after the battle, it's from 1776. And we have um, kind of the focus on the geography and kind of the naval battle that's happening here. And then in the foreground, the red coats, the blue coats, and a skirmish in, um, there but we don't really get the story of, of individuals here. This is kind of a broad brushstrokes view, and I, I believe this is at the National Gallery of Art. Here's another quick peek at how artists uh, depicted the Battle of Bunker Hill. And again, there's that focus on geography. It's the, the sense that the artists might have seen this, but they were very far away, out of harm's way. This is another 18th century picture. We don't know the artist's name in this case, but we can just sort of barely make out the line of soldiers up on the hill here. So back to what John Trumbull did. And we can already begin to see how he's doing this so differently. The geography in this case is really secondary. There's just the suggestion of, of the water out through the back here. Instead, we get kind of the chaos of these bodies, the chaos of the fighting, and then the emphasis on this dying general. And you can see at this moment, he is about to be bayoneted by or stabbed with a bayonet um, 
by uh, an officer, by a British officer. <clears throat> And one of um, General Wolfe's comrades is kind of guiding the hand of the bayonet away so that General Warren could sort of die with dignity. You can see that there's actually a British officer that is stepping in as well to kind of hold back that bayonet. So it's again that sense of um, in this moment, uh, you even had rivals, your military foes were even acting with honor and with dignity. And, um, and then there's that kind of celebration of the, the fallen martyr here. And so you have somebody like Trumbull who is, again, sort of using all these different sources in order to create a picture that tells a great story. And he may have even been thinking about religious imagery too, because I think that there's a lot here that sort of relates to images of the lamentation after Jesus is um, taken down off the cross and his uh, friends and family members and supporters kind of gather around his dying body and su support his dying body. Um, it, it, this is a, a, a traditional story in the history of art and might have helped to inform what John Trumbull was doing. So John Trumbull also created these major uh, paintings for uh, that now hang in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. And this is just one of them. It's called the, De the Declaration of Independence, it, which obviously was signed in 1776. But this was painted a full 40 years later. So we don't get the sense that this, well, I, I think we cannot look at this with, with the expectation that what we're looking at is what it looked like when this document was presented or signed. Um, what we are looking at is um, a depiction of 56 of the signers, which is, again, sort of anachronistic in and of itself. There were only 47. <laughs> there are five people depicted in this painting who were not signers, and then there are 14 people who were omitted. So there's a real kind of mix in terms of, a mixed bag in terms of, of what is historically accurate here. But we do know that Trumbull was so committed to depicting faces accurately. Um, and, and if you look carefully, you can almost, you, you almost get the sense that this is like school picture day. You know, everybody's lined up and you want to be able to see every face and, um, and make sure everybody's accounted for. So um, Trumbull was primarily working off of portrait miniatures that he had created. In the front, we have John Hancock, we've got Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams over here. And um, let's see, here's a, a picture of, of, of the painting in, in the rotunda of the US Capitol to give you a sense in terms of how large it is. Uh, I, I think sometimes that's lost when you're just looking at it, but these figures are sort of life size. And then in terms of how it functions kind of in our popular culture, it's on the backside of a $2 bill. I mean, we all own a Gilbert Stewart on the $1 bill, but I'm not sure if everybody here has a Trumbull unless you've kind of squirreled one of these away. I do think that this image has been on more US history textbook covers than, <laughs> than we could ever know. I swear to God, it was on my US history textbook cover. And, and I think, when we don't spend a little time investigating an image like this, I think it's so easy to accept it as uh, an actual document of what the signing of the Declaration of Independence looked like. I never questioned it when it was on my own textbook. Um, interestingly, this picture has been sort of criticized over the years for making what is in fact a really revolutionary act look rather boring, right? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't even look like they're debating anything here. It looks like a very um, formal, kind of straightforward presentation of, um, of just a standard everyday bill. <laughs> it doesn't look like um, uh, the revolution or the breaking away from, from a major superpower. Uh, um, this painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which is actually in the White House's collection, I think adds a little bit of drama to the scene. You have people with their hands out and you get the sense that they're arguing or that they're you know, devoting their lives to what they're committing to paper here. This was done by a French artist named um, Armand Dumaresque. 
um, uh, and this was done in 1873, so a little closer to the fact. So it's interesting that Trumbull tr uh, decided to, to convey such an important act with um, so much reservation and dignity there. So we have the signing of the Declar Declaration of Independence in the US Capitol. I also wanted to quickly show you just a few of the other paintings that, that, um, that he did that are included there. We talked before about surrender paintings. This is the, uh, the surrender at Saratoga, an event from 1777, which he painted much later in 1821. And something like this would have been um, no doubt inspired by the kind of the tradition and the history of, of depictions of surrenders um, uh, in the history of art. So we looked at Velasquez's uh, uh, surrender at, at Breda and you can see a very similar format here. The victors are on the right, they're upright, they're formal, several of the figures are looking out directly at us and then our um, our, our British are surrendering over here on the left. And, um, and I think what's really important with both of these is again, this idea of, of accepting um, the surrender of a foe with kind of dignity and humanity. So in this case, um, the, the general here is actually inviting the British into his tent uh, that there's a, uh, that, that we as Americans can kind of rise above the, the military conflict there and, and treat our enemies as, as real people here in, in this picture, I think is, is something that was worth recording and worth conveying. Um, it says a lot about us, it says a lot about our enemy. And then one other important picture from the, the US Rotunda that uh, was painted by John Trumbull is this one here, which is General George Washington resigning his commission. And this was an event that happened in 1783. It was painted 41 years later. So again, it's hard to accept this as actual fact. It's an artist's recreation of an event. And so um, Trumbull talked about how this event in particular was um, one of the highest moral lessons ever given to the world. So this was George Washington saying, you know, I'm no longer going to serve as, as leader of this army. Um, and, and, you know, all these important people have been inserted into the picture to accept his resignation. But in many ways, this is almost, it, it almost looks like a coronation picture. Um, so I'll, I'll, another Jacques-Louis David picture from, a, from um, the first part of the 1800s over here on the left, uh, much more formal. We've got, you know, the, the regalia of monarchy, but we have everybody present to kind of witness this, um, uh, the, the uh, passage of power from, from one party to another. And George Washington, of course, is kind of held up by John Trumbull in this case, because, um, because he has uh, the humility and the foresight to, to abdicate power as opposed to um, try to grab for more in this case. But we've got all of the elements that suggest that this is, you know, um, inherent in a representative democracy, complete with the architecture that recalls, you know, ancient Rome, ancient Greece. And we see uh, the wife of the general up here in the balcony. And you can almost even see the General George Washington's seat here is, is set up as though it were a throne. But he, um, again, he has this, this high kind of moral value in the picture for, um, for standing up uh, slightly taller, it seems, than anybody else in the room and, and handing over his, his, his power to, um, to others in our representative democracy. So we will finish up with um, just a few uh, few paintings that I think are so much fun and really sort of fly in the face of, of art as historical fact. <laughs> so I think, like I said at the beginning, I think we oftentimes um, <clears throat> fall into the trap of believing that any painting about um, history is somehow true when in fact, <laughs> it's often exactly the opposite case. Many paintings 
are, um, are not based in fact or reality at all. They are complete um, uh, representations of an, of an artist's idea of what might have happened. And then we have all these other influences. We have this idea that the artist is probably familiar with the history of art and wants to create something that speaks to that more so than the actual history, historical event that they're doing, that they're painting. Um, and they have a sense of composition and all these other things that, that really influence the way they put together a picture versus uh, the dedication to trying to get historical details correct. So this is uh, one of my favorite paintings from the, uh, about the revolution. It was not done at all during the revolution. This was painted um, more than a half, a half a century later. This was painted in 1854. And the subject here is a woman named Abigail Dolbear Hinman, painted by an artist named Daniel Huntington. And this is at the Lyman Allen Art Museum down in New London, Connecticut. And um, Abigail Hinman played a, a, a role. <laughs> I think how big a role is sort of de debatable. But down in New London, Connecticut, we have um, the depiction of Benedict Arnold, who's kind of burning New London here. And there was kind of the local legend of Abigail Hinman, who supposedly saw the, um, the traitor and took out her musket and was ready to fire upon him. But then at sort of the last minute, for whatever reason, she doesn't. So I think that this is a really striking image of a very powerful woman who's armed <laughs> and ready to play a critical role in the revolution, but sort of stopped short of just doing that. Um, but, you know, there's all sorts. It's just rife with historical inaccuracies. I think sort of starting with the idea that anybody was, um, dressed this way during during the American Revolution on just just a typical day when your town's being burned that you would get into your 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 best dress with the pearls in your hair and your earrings on um, so so I think it's it's gorgeous and it's stunning um, but it probably doesn't tell an accurate story of what what this uh, historical event uh, might have actually looked like then you have artists um, like Emanuel Leutza who painted images like this one here called Mrs. Schuyler burning her wheat fields in approach of the British from 1852. So again, this is a mid-century picture um, done well after the fact of the revolution. And in this case, this is not, a, this is another event with kind of a leading lady, which is always exciting, but there's really no, um, uh, no proof that this ever actually happened. <laughs> so Schuyler, in this case, this would have been Alexander Hamilton's um, mother-in-law. And, um, and in this case, we don't know if she burned her fields to um, keep, the, keep the, the British army at bay, but it, it's a nice dramatic story and it's a nice dramatic picture. And, um, and very quickly, I'm just going to skip to our last picture here in the interest of time. Um, and it's by the same artist, Emanuel Leutze. And this is um, no doubt his most famous painting. It's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's one of the most famous paintings of the Revolutionary War, but it is done um, decades and decades later in the early 1850s. And so there's a great deal about it that um, can be called into question and is certainly not historically accurate. So this is painted 75 years after Washington crossed the Delaware River. Um, but I think that there's something about this picture and the fact that it's so big, <laughs> it's such a monumental picture. Um, here it is with the, um, several people kind of acting it out at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's about 21 feet long. There's something about the scale of the picture that I think um, leads people to believe that what we're looking at is true. So this would have been Christmas night. This would have been uh, George Washington um, crossing in a snowstorm to surprise the British. But it, what we're looking at here is the crossing of the river, the sort of icy river. We don't see the snowstorm in this case. We have George Washington who's sort of lit by this unnatural light because of course the weather and, and the time of day don't really align with what was historically accurate. We've got um, sort of a cross section of all these different colonists in the boat here. Um, we've actually got um, 
the wrong kind of flag for what would have been um, appropriate at the time. And, um, and, and instead of getting all these historical details correct, <laughs> oh, another detail that I think is, is off but also very delightful is these sort of jagged chunks of ice in the Delaware River. If you've, if, <laughs> I, I think we all know that in America, our, our rivers don't ice up this way. So our, this German artist was probably painting how the Rhine River looked when on an icy day. And, um, and so instead, I mean, what I think we all focus on and connect to are, are not those historical details, but the fact that, you know, Washington's standing up in the boat, that he's looking um, off to the, the distant shoreline, that he's got this look of determination, of, of power, of, of might is right, um, even though he's got this kind of ragtag team we get the sense of the struggle of pulling this, this, this boat through the water, through the ice here. And, and again, that, that sense that, that George Washington has this, this kind of destiny. He's destined to lead this army to, um, to greatness and to success. So, um, so even though there's all these things that are historically inaccurate here, I think the bigger ideas still really resonate. And if you're, um, if you are concerned with, with historical realism, <laughs> they actually kind of reenact this, this scene every year on, on the Delaware River. So we can see here the boat is much bigger in real life. Um, Washington, even if he stood up in the boat, probably would have, would not have had such a prominent <laughs> figure. Probably would not have been such a prominent figure on on the bow of the ship. So, for us, just to to kind of wrap up here, I brought it. I brought back a few of the portraits of of, of George Washington that were painted during his lifetime, um, and I love to show all of these portraits together. Um, because, and, and I should mention, these are um, Gilbert Stewart, and then this one is Rembrandt Peel down here. I love to show these together because he looks so different in all of these pictures. And, and I think it's, our, it's a good reminder to all of us that, um, that all of these, these paintings were done by human hands um, and, can, and you know, understood through human eyes and human brains, which means that in some ways they're all flawed and they, they, don't, they aren't the depiction of actual fact. They're the depiction of an artist's representation or interpretation of what they see. And so it makes sense that from painting to painting, we see a huge variation in terms of of what George Washington looked like. And of course, you have that, that X factor of his false teeth in a lot of these too. But, um, but it's our bigger reminder that whenever we're, we're thinking of art as historical fact, that is a, a notion that should always be checked to a certain degree, right? So um, I hope you've enjoyed exploring the history of America through the images of some of our first great artists. And, um, and thank you for, your, for tuning in and your time and attention. And I look forward to connecting with you soon on, on our next topic. So thank you again and do take care.